Well, good morning. Happy Mother's Day. We are so thankful that you're here. Let me introduce myself if you're new this morning. Maybe we haven't met before. My name is Adam, and man, it's a privilege to have you here. If you're visiting, uh, come, some hey, come say hey after service. We'd love to, love to meet you. But we've been in a, we've been in a series entitled uh, Jesus Stories. We've been looking at the different miracles of Jesus. And uh, I wrote a really great message on Monday I mean, I'm telling you, it was really, really good. It was on Jesus turning water to wine and the relationship between Mary and Jesus. It was a great Mother's Day message. But on Tuesday morning, we were in staff prayer, and uh, I really just felt that the Lord begin to shift things. How, how, how much do you just love it when the Lord begins to do that in your own life? He, just, he began to speak to me and show me, you know, a different direction for this morning um, I really believe that we are in a strategic time uh, here at the church, but also a strategic time within the body of Christ. And the Lord began to lead me to Acts chapter 16. And I feel like this is where, where the Lord has us uh, this morning, where the Lord is really speaking to uh, the body of Christ in general. Um, and it's a very important day today, I feel. Very important day for us. Um, Let's, um, hmm. I want to pray right now. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak. Lord, we we just want your spirit just to move freely in our midst today. I bind every spirit with the Holy Spirit in this place. There will be no resistance this morning. Any walls that the enemy has put up in front of us, they must be torn down. We pray that, God, that there will be freedom today. Lord, would you fill my mouth today with your words? We only want to hear your voice to see clearly, God, what you have for us today as we walk boldly, God, to be a house of prayer. As we walk boldly, God, into the next place that you have for us and growing in you. Because, Lord, we know as we grow in you, Father God, and we go after you, the enemy tries to bring uh, uh, confusion, tries to put up walls, tries to put up barriers to hold us back. And, God, I just pray this morning, Jesus, that, Lord, you just release your Holy Spirit and that we could be complete joy, there would be complete freedom in this house today, God. That, Lord, you release your joy and your presence, God, in this place. We ask for more. We're not giving up. We're not backing down. We're going after you. So, Lord, as we open your word today, Lord, let it be rhema to us, Father. Let it be alive to us. Let it not just be words. God, we don't want to be people just going through the motions. But, Lord, we want to just be people, God, who are fighting this battle, God, but doing it joyfully and doing it joyfully in you, Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do today. We love you. And everyone said amen, amen, amen. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer. Say, as we went to prayer. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her master's much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, Turn and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. But her master saw that their hope of profit was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our cities. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up 
together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely, having received such a charge. He put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. I've entitled my message this morning this. It's a great title for a Mother's Day message, not really. The Spirit of Divination. The Spirit of Divination. Um, this past week on Tuesday night, my family and I, we, uh, we played for the first time uh, pickleball. And I don't know if you've ever played it before. It's one of the fastest growing sports in, uh, in the nation. And pickleball is like a mix between uh, ping pong and tennis. Uh, the, the racket feels kind of like a, 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 a ping pong racket, you know, but it's a smaller racket, but you're in a court half the size of a, of a tennis court, uh, which is really great for me because I don't like running too much anymore, you know, and I'm getting a little bit older. And uh, so you, you kind of stay, stay put. It's a lot of fun for doubles. And so we went as a family and we played uh, some pickleball. And uh, we're hitting the ball back and forth, and we start playing a game. Now, one thing you got to know about my family is this, that it's never just a game for us. It's never just a game. Maybe for Laura, it might be just a game. But for me and the kids, it's more like a battle. Like, we, we are there to win and we'll do anything we have to do to win. You know, every once in a while, I'll allow my kids to score a point. You know, most of the time, I'm there to win. I'm, I'm going to let them come the closest they possibly can to come to the point where they think they're going to win, and then I'm going to win. It's just how I'm wired, how I work. And one day, I know. One day, I know that especially Caleb, Ruth too, certain things, but especially Caleb, when it comes to sports, there'll be a day where he can beat his dad. But right now, for the next couple of years, I'm going to enjoy getting my W's against him. So Caleb, having this competitive gene that his dad has, and also Ruth having this competitive gene as well, Ruth would look at other, because like I said, it's the first time uh, us playing this game, Ruth would look at um, the other people playing on the other courts, because she's learning how to play. She's watching them, how they're hitting the ball, the rules, all this kind of stuff. And Caleb being in the middle of the game, uh, he didn't care that his, his sister was not looking. He would go ahead and hit the ball and score a point. And he'd be like, hey, I just scored. And Ruth is turning around like, I was looking at something else. Like, nope, that's a point. You know, he's counting points while she's not looking and trying to score. And he's, uh, and he's trying to win the game. And it doesn't really matter that his sister's not paying attention He's saying, hey, we're playing a game right here, Ruth. I still scored anyways because you weren't paying attention. This is what I'm telling you this morning. I think some of us are a little bit like Ruth. We recognize and we know that we're in the game, we're in this battle, but we're not paying attention. We're not paying attention. We know we're in a war, we know we're in a battle, we've lost our desire to pray, we've lost this desire to spend time with the, in the word, we've lost this desire to spend time with Jesus, we've lost and we recognize, okay, we're in a battle, but we're not asking the Lord for what? We're not asking the Lord for discernment, Lord, what's really going on right now? And we know we're in the battle, but we only come on Sunday mornings and we're only engaging at that particular moment one day a week. Throughout the week, though, we're missing it all. We're in this battle, in this war. If you've been at Journey for any amount of time, you know this. If you're new this morning, we are in a spiritual battle. In heavenly places that we do not see, that we, don't not, do not, we, 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 we do not know, but the spiritual battle is more real than what we even see with our own physical eyes. And we've got to know that not only do we have to know that we're in a battle, but we've got to be engaged in this battle at all times. Let me read this to you. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the what? For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity 
to the obedience of Christ. We are in a battle. And just think about that. If we're in a battle, don't you think that God's going to give us discernment about what the tactics of the enemy are in this battle? He's going to show us out of his grace and out of his love for us. Because the battle shouldn't scare us. We should just be engaged and know because we already won the battle through Jesus. Spiritual discernment is so important that we recognize what is going on in the spiritual realm. And oftentimes, God is trying to speak to us. He's trying to get our attention, but we're not, we may hear his voice, but we're not really obedient to his voice. Here's the thing. Israel did this over and over and over again. The Lord was trying to get their attention, calling Israel, the people of Israel, back to him. But time and time again, they went through this cycle of drawing near to God and then falling away after another generation. That next generation would turn to sin, would turn to away from God and worshiping other idols instead of the one true God. And God was constantly working on them, calling them back to just worship unto him. And Isaiah, a prophet, was called to be a mouthpiece for the people of Israel to speak to them. And he has this vision in Isaiah chapter 6. He has this vision of heaven. And he sees the seraphim. He sees the worship going on in heaven, just as we sang uh, earlier. And they're, and they're singing, holy, holy, holy. He has this vision of heaven. And, he's, and, he, and he comes to this realization in his life like, woe is me. I am completely undone. And he hears the Lord's voice. And the Lord's voice says this in verse 8, who shall I send? Who shall I send? Listen, the Lord is speaking to us today. Who shall I send? Who is going to be a warrior for the kingdom of God? Who is not going to sit on the sidelines, but who is going to be engaged in this battle? And Isaiah, after seeing this vision of heaven, his only response then is this, here I am, Lord, send me. How many of you just want to say, God, here I am, Lord, send me? Anyone? Come on. Here I am, Lord, send me. That's where I'm at this morning. Here I am, Lord, send me. And then he tells Isaiah this. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy. And shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes. And hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. You see, the Lord kept telling them to stay true to the one true God, but they wouldn't listen. He kept trying to get their attention, but yet they kept on having to learn this lesson the hard way. I don't want to learn the hard way. I want to hear the voice of God, and I want to listen to the voice of God, and not only want to listen to the voice of God, but I want to put it into action. Amen? Oftentimes, you might be wondering, well, God's not speaking to me right now. Why is he so silent? Maybe it's because the Lord's already told you what to do, but you haven't done it yet. The Lord oftentimes is speaking to us constantly, and sometimes when his voice is the quietest, because he's already told us, Adam, you need to do this. But I haven't put into action yet. In the moments of my own life, when I... um, feel like the, 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 the voice of the Lord is silent, it's really one of two reasons. Maybe I haven't been obedient in spending time with him, but the other reason is maybe I haven't been obedient with what he's already told me to do. Have you been obedient with what he's already told you to do? What if we went from not paying attention and not putting things into action to then getting in this battle and in the game and begin to listen to the voice of God and putting into action? What if we asked the Lord what he is speaking and saying and took action 
against the enemy and stop being in the game only when we're at church on a Sunday and start being in the game as a warrior for God all the time. Being a warrior in every morning, being a warrior every evening, become a people that begin to fight for our families, fight for this world, fight for this nation, be a people that begin to fight for our kids, be a people that are engaged in this battle. We've got to be engaged. We can't just say, man, I'm in this spiritual battle right now, but I'm not going to be engaged. We've got to recognize and know we have to be engaged because what is culture doing today? Man, it is trying to take away so much. And the enemy is so sly. Like he, he puts things in right underneath their noses and begins to take ground one thing after the other. Think about it right now in culture. Like you can identify any way that you want to identify today. A man can be a woman, a woman can be a man. I was looking at something this past week and there was an argument that this 50-year-old could identify as a 13-year-old and then being a 13-year-old, then they can do what they want with a 12-year-old? Like, what is going on? This is crazy. I heard an argument by a supposed pastor and he, and he said that because God commanded the people of Israel to be circumcised and we still practice today, then it's okay to mutilate your body and to change your sex. Like, what is going on? Like, these are the arguments coming out today. And we're sitting idly on the sidelines thinking, okay, it's just going to take care of itself. And we're not engaging in the battle in in prayer, we're not gauging in the battle with, with the Lord and we're not being led by his spirit. Like we can't just sit idly by and watch the enemy take ground. We've got to stand up for the fight of what the Lord is calling us to fight for. And here's the thing about it. If anything, it kind of excites me a little bit because as the darkness is getting darker, I know the light is getting lighter. And what is happening is the Lord is going to pour out his glory. He's going to pour out his spirit in these last days. And we get to experience that glory if we don't sit on the sidelines. We become a people that engage in battle. And what I know is that the Lord is calling us to a place of experiencing the, the, the measure of his Holy Spirit in these last days that is unprecedented in human history. We're not doing anything special here at Journey. We're just saying, okay, we're going to be engaged in this battle. We're going to experience an outpouring of his presence because that's what's going to happen happen in these last days as we are people engaged in battle, but if we are sitting on the sidelines, we're going to be passed over. I'm here to tell you this morning, we're not going to be passed over. What we're going to do, we're going to be engaged in battle, and we're going to experience a measure of the glory of God like we've never experienced a measure of the glory of God before. How many of you just want the Lord just to move mightily in our midst? That is my one true desire. And so as I began to pray this week, the Lord kind of showed me in this, in this battle, in this spiritual battle, where we are really at. Because I think that oftentimes when we come to a place of prayer and this spiritual pursuit after the Lord, going after a greater measure, the enemy will try to do everything he can to distract, try to wear you down, to speak lies in your ear. And you've got to discern, is this the Holy Spirit or is it something else? So I want to give you three things this morning from Acts chapter 16. Three things this morning from Acts chapter 16. that I felt like the Lord is speaking through this text to us. So number one today, number one, when becoming a person of prayer, you will face spiritual opposition. You have to know that when becoming a person of prayer, or for us, a house of prayer, you will experience spiritual opposition. Watch this. Now it happened as we went to prayer. Now it happened as we went to prayer. We've said this, that we declared this beginning of the year. I felt like last year the Lord gave us this vision of supernatural multiplication. And the number one way that we're going to see supernatural multiplication is to make this place, Journey Church, a literal house of prayer. 
We got to know that when we make it a house of prayer, the reason why we're doing that is because we want one thing, and we want it to see a move of God in our midst. And here's the thing about that is that revival, a move of God, it will never be comfortable. You can't put the Holy Spirit in a box. It will be messy, and it will also have a price tag attached to it, a price tag of prayer. There's a battle going on, and there's a price tag to be engaged in the battle. And he's calling us to be what? Engaged in this battle. And so as we're going after this, and becoming a house of prayer, we will experience what? Spiritual opposition. Look at the opposition Paul encountered here. And that would happen as we went to prayer. That a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. So let's look at this. I don't want to stretch the text. I don't want to make something that it's not. I just want to tell you exactly what the text is speaking and saying here. Okay? So the Greek word here for divination is literally python. Its definition in the Greek is this. A pagan form of foretelling or declaring secret or obscure knowledge through signs, omens, or spiritual powers. So this all comes back to the spirit of divination, spirit of Python here in the Greek. It goes back and and you look, when you look at the Greek language, uh, it comes from a place in a nearby region called Pytho. And it was an area on top of a mountain where in Greek mythology, Apollo defeated this serpent. So back in that period of time, people would worship this serpent on top of this mountain and draw its power from this demonic spirit. And so this oracle was up on, was was placed on top of the mountain in Delphi and they would worship this demonic spirit. And from that demonic spirit, it would allow them to, how many know the demonic spirits? Like it, it has a certain degree of power, nothing compared to the spirit of Jesus, nothing declared to the Holy Spirit, but they could fortune tell, they could tell the future from worship, from the worship they did on top of this mountain to this pagan God. Now let me be really clear to you, Pastor Eric said this last week, I want to say it again because it's important that you know this that if you are a Christian, you cannot be possessed as this uh, slave girl was. You cannot be possessed by a demon uh, if you are a Christian. Why? Because when you are saved, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of your spirit man. Now, let me look at this in a theological standpoint, how I kind of believe. So when you give your life to Jesus... Your Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you, the spirit man. But Paul talks about having to renew your mind daily, right? So you're you're made up of three parts, your spirit, your soul, and your body. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your body is your body. But every single day, what are you going to do? You have to listen to the Holy Spirit, not other spirits that try to get your attention, and renew your mind by the Holy Spirit daily. If you're not renewing your mind daily, then it gives room for the enemy to come in and whisper in your ear, to come and take a stronghold in your life, right? And so you cannot be possessed if you're a Christian, but you can be affected by other spirits. So the spirit of divination, you can be affected by it. Now let's continue reading here. The slave girl was sent to wear down Paul and Silas as they minister in the area. Verse 17. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. So this slave girl who is possessed by the spirit of divination is proclaiming truth about Paul and Silas. Look at it. These servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. To me, that's crazy. Like what what begins to happen is sometimes as you become a person of prayer, you'll become a person where the spirit 
of, of the enemy will try to mock you. Will try to cause anything to do for you not to be engaged with the Lord. My grandmother, she was, uh, she was a, a person of prayer, man. She, uh, I remember her just walking around the house, worshiping the Lord, always praying. But my grandfather, he, he, he wasn't a Christian. And he would, until actually the, the last week of his life, praise God. And, uh, but he would mock my grandmother, say, man, Martha, uh, you're, 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 you're too spiritual. Uh, you're just a Jesus freak. She, she would mock, he, he would mock her. You have to know that if you're a person of prayer, that there might be moments in time where, where, where the enemy will try to mock you. Uh, he doesn't want you to pray. You know that, right? The enemy is going to try to tell you everything he possibly can to say, hey, you're, you're too tired. Don't go pray. You're too tired. Don't worry about it. Don't go pray. You're, um, you've been going through a lot. It doesn't matter. Don't pray. Hey, God doesn't, God doesn't hear your prayers. Like the enemy will try to mock you as you become a person of prayer. You're too busy. You're too tired. Just do it later. But you've got to discern, is this the Holy Spirit or is another spirit speaking to me? And it may even be right. That's what's crazy about this text. It may even be right. What's being said may even be right. But it's not the Holy Spirit. Verse 18. And this she did for many days. So this went on. This is crazy. That Paul, Paul was allowing this because he didn't really recognize in the beginning for it to go on for many days. And it says this. But Paul greatly annoyed the Greek word for annoyed here means this. It means to toil, be worried, grieved, to exert oneself, strive, accomplish with great labor. Accomplish with great labor. So Paul was ministering in this region, and the work of the ministry was hard. You ever been in a place before where you've been ministering, and you just felt like, man, this is really difficult right now. I don't know why it's so laborious. I don't know why it's so difficult. And Paul was greatly annoyed by the spirit that possessed this girl. And finally, Paul realizes why ministry was so hard, and he looks at uh, the girl, but he speaks to the demon and says, Get out of here in the name of Jesus. Notice he doesn't talk to the girl, but what does he talk to? He talks to the demon. Look at this. Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. What name? Jesus. Come on, what name? Jesus. Because Jesus. Jesus has all power. That's why we talked about authority for two weeks, because we have to recognize that we don't own any power. As we humble ourselves and sit underneath the lordship of Christ, then we're able to walk in the power that God has given us. But we have no power personally unless we sit underneath the authority of the Father, the authority of Jesus. So in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her, and he came out of her that very hour, instantly, this girl is set free by the power of Jesus. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. If you continue to read, they're thrown into prison, they're beaten, they go through difficulty. You see, when you're a person of prayer, at different moments and times in life, it might reach to a point to where prayer and ministry becomes extremely hard and difficult because the enemy does not want you to be a person of prayer because he knows that there's power in prayer. He will attack your mind, your heart, your health. But he's given us a weapon, church. Here's the good part. Let's turn it right now. He's given us a weapon. Which leads me to point number two. When becoming a person of prayer, praise is a weapon. Acts 16, 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. 
But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So Paul and Silas, they come into this area, and they're ministering to, uh, to Macedonia, to this area, and it's very hard, it's very laborious because there's a spirit of divination that's coming against them. And uh, when they cast out uh, the spirit out of this demon girl, uh, demon-possessed girl, what begins to happen? She's set free, and then the authorities that control this slave girl then were angry at them, and they beat them, they, uh, they uh, uh, threw them into jail, right? But what happened? In that jail cell, they began to praise God. You see, they didn't fix their eyes on the problem. They didn't fix their eyes on uh, the spirit uh, that was coming up against them. What do they do? They fix their eyes on Jesus. You see, we don't fix our eyes on our problems. We don't fix our eyes on the circumstances. When you're going through a difficult time, what do you do? You fix your eyes on what? You fix your eyes on Jesus and Jesus first and Jesus alone. You see, the, the, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, has given us discernment about what is happening going on, but we don't fix our eyes on that. What do we do? We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, the one who has control over it all, the one who's sovereign over it all. Yep. So listen, maybe this Mother's Day, you're tired because you're balancing work and family and it's difficult. What do we do in those circumstances? We fix our eyes on Jesus. Maybe you've got financial stress today. What do you do though? You fix your eyes on Jesus. Maybe you're a single mom, you feel like you lack support. What do you do? You fix your eyes on Jesus. Maybe the, 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 the uh, chores are piling up. What do you do? You fix your eyes on Jesus. You're struggling with parenting decisions. You fix your eyes on Jesus. Maybe you lost a mom this past year. What do you do? You fix your eyes on Jesus because what? He will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. And you're feeling worn down by the stresses of life. What do you do? You fix your eyes on Jesus. You see, the enemy will try to come in. He'll try to choke out your spiritual life. He'll try to make you not want to be a person of prayer. But what do we do? Despite how we might feel inside, despite our circumstances, despite what is going on, we fix our eyes on Jesus. And I'm here to tell you today that you can have victory and you will have victory victory. So we don't fight for victory. What do we do? We fight from victory, from the place of praise. You see, Paul and Silas, they didn't choose to be down. They didn't choose to be in their circumstances. They, didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't, they made a choice not to fix their eyes on the spirit that was attacking them. What do they do? They made a choice to fix their eyes on Jesus. That's why they were able to be in a prison cell worshiping God. And they weren't just worshiping God silently. How were they worshiping the Lord? They were worshiping God loudly. Loudly, where everyone could hear them. They weren't backing down. They weren't putting their eyes on the circumstances, but they were fixing their eyes on Jesus. See, let's not give the enemy too much credit here. Sometimes we give the enemy way too much credit. What do we do? We fix our eyes on Jesus. He's under, the enemy's under our feet. He's already lost. It's just a formality at this point. So because we understand that, we will worship. We will praise God for the victory we already have in him. You have to understand that praise and worship is a pathway to his presence. And in his presence... There is absolute fullness of joy. Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. Come on, say there's joy in his presence. Come on, church. Say one more time. There's joy in his presence. So you know, no matter what circumstances... You may be in, no matter what obstacle you might be facing this morning, choose praise. Yeah? Choose praise. Praise is a weapon, and we will have victory. So not only does praise give you victory, but it leads 
to evangelism. Watch this. Number one, when becoming a person of prayer, you will face spiritual opposition. Number two, when becoming a person of prayer, praise is your greatest weapon. And number three, when you are, when you are a person of prayer, your worship is evangelistic. So we don't think of worship being evangelistic, but man, it is. Acts 16, 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Can you imagine being in a prison and hearing this praise going on in that prison right there at that moment? And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose. You see, when you worship, it has potential to break every chain of other people that other people are experiencing. When you begin to worship, it changes the atmosphere of the room. When you begin to worship, it breaks every stronghold of the enemy. It breaks down the walls that the enemy has erected in front of you. Because what do you do? You begin to fix your eyes on Jesus, not the situation, not the problem, not whatever demonic spirit you're dealing with. What do you do? You fix your eyes on Jesus, you begin to praise, and not only begin to praise, but you begin to praise loudly, and it changes the atmosphere, it changes everything, and what happens is people want what you got. They're like, how are you worshiping in the middle of that circumstance? How are you worshiping in the middle of that problem? Because I've got the joy of the Lord, and the joy of the Lord is my strength. You see, the joy of the Lord begins to take over because the presence of God is there. And the only the presence of God, there's only peace. There is only joy. And so as you worship him, the, the atmosphere is filled with peace and joy. And it overcomes any other spirit you might be facing. So we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus who gives us the joy your response is not fear. Your response is what? It's worship. You may be under demonic attack or a straight up struggle in your life. Your response is worship because worship tears down the walls that the enemies are erected. Worship breaks chains and strongholds. The worship of the King of Kings invites his presence. And in his presence, God changes everything. Look at verse 27 now. And the keeper of the prison, awaking, from sleep and seeing the prison's doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He's scared because he's afraid of the Roman law at that time because of the circumstances that begin to happen that he's going to be put to death. But watch what happens here. But call, Paul called with a loud voice saying, do, your, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Look at the care that Paul has for his, for his life. Verse 29, then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? He's like, how are you guys worshiping in a prison cell? Like, the, the, the power of God is, is unreal. Like, you were worshiping this God, and he loosed your chains, and he broke down the walls. I have to have what you have. Verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately him, uh, I'm sorry, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Amen. Think about this. Think about this entire story we just read. Paul and Silas, they're going to minister 
to these people. They're ministering the gospel. And the enemy comes against them with the spirit of divination. Because they knew the power of God that lives within them. And after some time, they were able to discern what was actually really going on. Because the authority that they walked in, they looked at the spirit, not the girl, and said, be gone in the name of Jesus. Come out and leave. They then went through trials and tribulations still. They were beaten, thrown into prison, and yet they worshiped. And yet they prayed. They didn't give up. They didn't back down. Listen, some of you in this room, what I feel so strongly, the Spirit of God on Tuesday morning is that some of you in this room, including myself, we've been in a place where we felt worn down. We felt like life is too much. We've lost our desire to go after the Lord with all of our hearts. We've lost this desire to be spiritually fervent. And to a level and degree, maybe the enemy has won in some areas, but I'm here to tell you this morning, we are reclaiming territory. We are reclaiming territory and land this morning because we're recognizing and knowing we're not going to put on the spirit of heaviness any longer. We're not going to listen to any of the spirit, but the Holy Spirit with a, with a, uh, life might be hard. Life, my, life might be difficult. Li life might be uh, dealing us a difficult hand right now, but what we're going to do is we're going to put on what the garment of praise it says for the spirit of heaviness how many of you just want to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness Listen, you might, be a, you might be a mom in this room and you might have just been struggling with life and you might just be like, I don't know what to do, it's so hard. You might be a single mom and it's like, life is just too much. When it just feels like life is too much, what do you do? You put on, it's a choice, you choose, just like Paul and Silas, I'm gonna put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I'm not gonna choose to be heavy, I'm not gonna choose to listen to life circumstances, I'm going to choose to praise. And Paul and Silas, they praised in that prison cell and the walls were broken down and what lies were given over and surrendered to Jesus. I believe that the Lord is calling us not to listen to circumstances or to the attacks of the enemy because I'm telling you, he will attack as we become people of prayer. God called us here to be a house of prayer and what he will do is he'll try to call it down. He will, he will put up, he will put up, the enemy will try to put up things in our way but what we're doing today is we're saying, man, we're going to come right up over that wall. We're going to come right up over that mountain and we're going to choose worship. We're going to choose praise. That's what we're doing today. Would you rise with me?